Uh, I think everything's fine. Is it, Teresa, with you? Nobody called me? Yes, okay, good. So we are ready to commence. And I'm very pleased to introduce the um, first speaker of our session and also the, the chair of the session, Professor Raymond Chung, who is an associate professor in the Department of Anatomy, investigator and coordinator of Research Center for Heart, Brain, Hormone and Healthy Aging, investigator and executive management committee member of the State Key Laboratory of Brain and Cognitive Sciences. Dr. Chung is also the founder and secretary of the Hong Kong University Alzheimer's Disease Research Network. He has published over 100 peer-reviewed publications and nine book chapters in neurodegeneration, neuroimmunology, and drug discovery in these areas. Dr. Chung is now the scientific advisory board member for International Alzheimer's Parkinson's Disease Symposium, a scientific review committee for the Alzheimer Association in the United States. He is the handling associate editor of the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease and section chief editor for the Journal of Neuroimmune Pharmacology. He is also a member of the 12, I'm sorry, of the editorial board of more than 12 additional journals. And it's a great pleasure for me to welcome Professor Chung as he's a friend and we've worked together for over 10 years at the University of Hong Kong. And he certainly leads and takes full responsibility for all activities at the university in the field of Alzheimer's. So without further ado, we'll hand to the team in Hong Kong to play Professor Chung's pre-recorded video and then come for Q&A before the end of the hour. Thank you. Professor Chang will be sharing screen with us. Yes. Um, thank you for the invitation from Brandon. And I'm very glad to share what we are doing in Hong Kong. And so I'm a basic scientist. And since um, we developed the Hong Kong University Alzheimer's Disease Network. So we have an opportunity to uh, make interdisciplinary uh, study uh, with different uh, sectors. For example, so with abandoned uh, uh, so faculty of education and faculty of social science and also even faculty of dentistry and medicine, of course. So today, the topic I'm going to uh, share with you is to, from basic scientist's point of view, how to recognize risk factors and potential preventive method in Alzheimer's disease. Um, so before I um, introduce what our topics, uh, let me give a one minute or two minutes to uh, introduce what we are doing. Basically, we have three categories to work on. The first category is on the uh, basic science of the neurodegeneration mechanisms. And we, uh, we name the synapse, the autophagy. And the second category is on the risk factor. This is the main point. I'm going to talk about this. And this involves immune, immune response in the body and neuroimmune response in the brain. And the third category is about how to prevent, and that is related to what I have long-term research on the uh, herbal medicines and recently on exercise. And also how the spread, how the pathogens spread from one particular brain region to another brain regions. And that is also involved how fast or how, uh, how fast the patient deteriorate. Um, in neurodegenerations. So as I said, the main point is on the second uh, category on the risk factor. Now, if we look into the, um, the worldwide projections of Alzheimer's disease, and so you can say, um, you can see um, in year 2050, we have over hundred millions of uh, patients in um, suffering Alzheimer's disease. In Asia, so it will be much worse. So um, as I am a basic scientist, so uh, it's good to use at least one slide to look into what happens in your brain. And in the brain, you have the neurodegeneration, that's why you have atrophy in the brain. And you ha we have um, two neuropathologies. One is amyloid plaques, that is uh, uh, beta amyloid formations. 
and also neural fibrillar tangle because of tau protein uh, phosphorylation and aggregations. And so these are two neural pathologies and also uh, together with the atrophy in the brain. And this actually uh, the, uh, the classical um, uh, nearly standards of uh, detecting the brain, what's the problem in the brain. And now, of course, we have another component is the immune response within the brain. Now, if we look into the class, uh, typical picture of this, uh, the disease progressions, in the red line, we know that the, by the time you know to bring your relatives and family members to uh, uh, clinicians to campaign for cognitive problems, it will be already in the MCI or even in dementia level. And by this time, if you look back the pathology curve, the pathology is nearly plateau. And that's why there's a lot of failure on the clinical trials. And if you follow the curve of the pathology, you can see that even in the cognitive normal state, the pathology start to develop. And why this pathology start to develop and that's involved the, what we call the risk factor. Now, of course, our lifestyle, our environment, and what we encounter in our lifetime, and also aging process, all these can accumulatively um, um, increase the storage of the bad proteins. And those bad proteins are the amyloid peptides, and aggregated tau proteins. And all these factors include the traumatic brain injury, midnight obesity, midnight hypertension, secret smoking, diabetes, or aging, and even sleep disturbance. All these can increase the risk of getting um, Alzheimer's pathology. And with time, pathology build up. And this is what we think of how the getting the symptoms of cognitive impairments from mild in, uh, cognitive impairments, MCI, to a state of the Alzheimer's disease in the severe state. And then brain HOV occurs from one particular brain region and spread to the whole brain. Now, as a basic scientist, we try to work on the basic mechanisms of why this can be a risk factor and find a common uh, importance factors and how these, all these risk factors get involved and then contribute to disease progressions. And for the past 10 years, we have been studying a one by one of different risk factors developed all these different animal models. And we find a one convergent pathway that continues since the brain and neuron is information. And as Time magazines cover this information and can also affect heart attack, cancer, and of course, Alzheimer's. So for me now, I think Alzheimer's is very similar to cancer developments. One hit is not enough and multi-hit will start to develop the problem. Now, if we think about inflammation, the body immune response, the first thing is very obvious to think about is we get sick. When we have fever, we lost appetite, we don't want to eat, we don't want to walk, we don't want to do anything. We have reduced social activity. And this psychological symptom actually is because of some factor going into your brain and that caused the problem. And of course, when we get infected and just like what we encounter now, the COVID-19 or even before the SARS and also birth flu, all these kind of infectious disease or even very simple influenza, then that will cause you um, weakness. And that sometimes is not just because of the virus factors, the virus factors or the viral particle going into your brain, but also the immune function in the brain. And immune function go into your brain. 
And you may not be aware that actually even your mouth, your oral cavities have problems. If you, if the Alzheimer patient forgets to brush teeth and bacteria can grow on the teeth and then will cause the problems of periodontitis. And this periodontitis actually is an activation of your body immune response. And that can, again, build up your uh, neural immune response in the brain. And this is what we also uh, collaborate with uh, faculty of dentistry and also a Japanese group together working on how the oral cavity health affects the brain progressions uh, degenerations. And this is our, uh, um, our uh, working hypothesis because of the de uh, degenerations of the teeth and also the gum because of the bacteria and then build up the immune response or the cytokines, the factors released by the immune cells go into this area and then attracts the, all the immune cell macrophage. They can engulf the tissue and then also infiltrate into the blood vessel and also go into the brain. Now in the, in the past, what you learn from the textbook is the brain has the brain epithelial cell, has the blood-brain barriers that can uh, uh, exclude all these immune cells. But now we know that actually all, nearly all activated immune cells have found a way to go into the brain without really damaging the blood vessels or blood barrier. So we are working on this direction too. So just give you a, an idea of why body immune response is important. Now in not in some situation, not only of course from the um, uh, infections, but also some elderly patients after the surgery, and they have a um, time that they forget many things. Now, of course, this is only a transient effect and the acute effect we call the delirium. Um, so this is a transient effect, but this transient effect may be a a short time, maybe a long time. But epidemiology telling us that if an elderly encounters several episodes of these kind of deliriums or uh, uh, sickness, and that will push them to have high chance of getting Alzheimer. Now, for a long time, we worked with uh, Department of Anesthesiology and thought that it is because of anesthetic agents. And now we realize that it's actually is because of the body immune response. And that is the study that I'm going to share with you what we have done. And this is the slide for summarize that actually different cytokines, the factor released by the immune cells can go into the brain for direct toxicity to neurons or indirectly activate one type of immune cells in, within the brain, we call the microglia, and they can further activate the um, more, uh, they can stimulate more cytokines and further destroy neighboring neurons. And for the acute, we have the delirium. For the chronic, we have the sickness response and if this occurs uh, repeatedly, and this will cause the long-term cognitive decline. And also will deposit all again the bad proteins we find in Alzheimer's disease. Now, this is the working hypothesis or working theory that we are, we are, we are doing different uh, laboratory experiments. Whatever infections or tissue injury, which will activate the body immune cells and they will produce more cytokines and these cytokines and immune cells together pass through the blood-brain barrier. The brain and the free immune cells go into the brain or activate the only one type of immune cells within the brain microglia and cause to amplify the 
what we call the neural inflammations. And this will disturb neurotransmissions or even kill around and cause sickness response at the very beginnings. And if sickness response long lasting, and this will cause neurodegenerations. And that's why we think that systemic inflammation in the, bra uh, and the brain has lots of connections. And by using laboratory animals, we use a method we call the laparotomies to illustrate these problems. And this work is working together with the Department of Anesthesiology on the what we call at the very beginning, what we call the post-operative cognitive dysfunctions to describe some elderly patients after surgical procedure, and they have the transient problems in their in remembering, uh, in, in understanding where they are, okay. Now, for laboratory animals, we use laparotomy. What is laparotomy? We have this laboratory uh, mice and open up the abdomens, take the intestine out without cutting, just massage them and put them back. And just by this procedure, similar to what um, a surgical procedure need. And then the mouse, we test behavior, we test for the cytokine productions, and then we find many surprising things. So the objectives is to understand the neural information play major role in cognitive dysfunctions induced by this simple uh, experimental procedure. And also we uh, investigate tau protein phosphorations um, and cognitive dysfunctions. Now, this is the uh, experimental protocol. And for those who are not uh, scientists in the uh, biological science, and so it's, it's just a very simple um, procedure to test the animal behavior, and then do this, what I told you about the laparotomy procedure, and afterwards, and we do behavioral tests. Now, at the very beginnings, we weight body weight, uh, we measure the body weight. And so the body weight drop down a little bit, and then we will come up better, uh, catch up with the normal one. So we have three groups. One is the control, one is the uh, cervopharin, it is the animal receives the anesthetic agents without the surgical procedure. Another is the laparotomy, LAP. We do, do uh, two types of the, um, uh, the behavioral tests. One we call the wine maze and one we call the novel object recognitions. For novel object recognitions, because mice, um, mouse actually can recognize those um, uh, uh, novel objects and the one they used to play with. So we can tell they can discriminate the old object and new objects. And after laparotomy for two weeks, we test this uh, uh, behavior and this is related to their uh, cognitive functions because they have to recognize, they have to tell which one is new toy, which one is old toy. So we found that the discriminating index decreased, indicating that they cannot really tell the difference after laparotomy. And if we look into the Y maze, Y maze is against the test uh, hippocampal uh, cognitive functions and also fear associated uh, cognitive functions. And we also find that they have the problems in, under, in remember where, which arm they have been. So this is the, the behavior that we can uh, find out that they have problem after this simple surgical procedure. Now this slide looks like very heavy, but it's very simple because we test the cytokine productions by the uh, gene expressions in the liver at the lower panel. We test liver because liver is a very sensitive organ telling what happened in your body. 
if there's any injury or infections or cytokine problems in the body, liver, as well as the brain will be the first organs that can tell us there's something, something strange, okay? And indeed, if you look into the liver, all different cytokine productions, and so you can find out that it's uh, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, interleukin-8 TNF-alpha, and also MCP once the monocyte chemoattractive proteins increase. And if we look into the brain region of the hippocampus, and also you can find the pro-inflammatory factors, that means to stimulate the uh, inflammation that's also increased in the hippocampus and also in the frontal cortex. And we don't see any anti-inflammatory cytokine productions in the brain. And that's telling us that the amplification uh, time is on to amplify the po in the, the in information within the brain. Now, if you look into the tau protein phosphorations, and we use the Western blood, that means running all the homogenated proteins into gel, and then to see whether the level go up or go down. And then we can see the phosphorations of the tau protein of curves uh, in the, either in the frontal cortex in the upper corner or in the lower panels is on the hippocampus. And you can see some of the apitals increase that's suggesting that the tau protein phosphorations increase. And this is the way how we uh, analyze tau protein phosphorations. Now, also, we can see that if we look into the microglia, whatever the morphology or the number, they are both a stimulated state. Microglia, similar to macrophage, when they are activated, the size of the cell body increase and the process increase because they try to grab what bat is nearby. So that's why by looking at this, we can see that they, um, the size increase, the number increase. Now, why do we know that this is immune uh, uh, related? Because if we, in principle, add the um, ibuprofen to the, to the mouse, and then we can immediately find out that ibuprofen reduced inflammation. Now, reduce information for the microglia so that the size and number are not activated state. And if we compare the behavior, if we add ibuprofen to suppress in body immune response, the, the behavior problems done by the novel object uh, vaccinations or YMAs are also being significantly reduced. And suggesting that if we are able to reduce body immune response, you are able to reduce neuroimmune response and also the cognitive dysfunctions and also the tau protein phosphorylation. So even the bad thing is not going to start to phosphorylate or start to accumulate. So we are very happy to see that ibuprofen really can attenuate the um, microglia response and also another cell type called astrocyte because we cut the brain and then do the, some kind of stinging. We can count the number of cells we can look into the size of the cells, suggesting whether they are in this activated state or not. So if we count everything, the cytokines production go down and we can, um, uh, we can, we can rescue neuro uh, cognitive dysfunctions. So the first line of summary telling us that Laparotomy is an animal model that we can use to simulate what happens of post-operative cognitive dysfunction. And we find that 
This is because of a body immune response trigger neuro immune response, and then trigger the bad protein accumulation, phosphorylation of tau, and even cognitive dysfunctions. If you have a way to reduce body immune response simply by the, in principle, ibuprofen, we can reduce neuroimmune response, attenuate cognitive dysfunctions, and also reduce phosphorylation of tau protein, the bad proteins accumulations. So it is, sounds like wonderful that if we can reduce body immune response, that is the way to go. But we know that you cannot have a long-term um, uh, uh, prescription of the ibuprofen because it will be uh, not good for your heart. And that's why we continue to understand the systemic information and brain. Now, I told you the, about the study that in the mouse, in the in laboratory animals. And now we extend our study even to zebrafish. Now, zebrafish has a characteristic that in the young state, they, their body have a transparent body. And so that we can use some manipulations to let, to allow the immune cells to express some fluorescent protein so that we can continue to trace, to visualize what happened of those immune cells. And in zebrafish, we cannot do laparotomy, but we have another way to do amputation. Now, amputation is another way to understand if your body has some problems, is this wound injury, and then what happens to those body immune system. Amputation is to cut the fin and to cut the tails of the fish. And of course, the tails of the fish can be regenerated because they are fish. And so if we cut the tails of the fish, zebra fish, we can visualize those macrophage actually going to the wound site. Now, this is the, the nearly the tails, they are clear cutting. And if we have, this is the control, and when you see all these white dog, these are the macrophage. And when we cut the towels, and then you can see those macrophage accumulate in the wound site. Now, the fun thing is, is we can see macrophage go to wound site, this is expected. But we can also see macrophage go into brain when there's a body injury. And this is taken, the picture taken when the zebrafish are in the three days or six days when they are still in the transparent state. And so this is a something very funny that we can find and we can ask the questions is how come when there's a body wound injury, the, your immune response not only go to the wound site, but also go to the brain. So what happened to those uh, um, when immune cells going to the, to the brain? We are still investigating. But we now know that one thing is, if you are able to knock out or minimize the level of one of the cytokine, interleukin-1 beta, we use mutations or genetically knock out interleukin-1 beta in zebrafish. And again, look into those uh, green dots, and we can immediately see this is the control, for example, and then this is the macrophage after amputation. That means cutting the wound, cutting the tail. And if we can cut down the interleukin one beta by mutation or not out we can also cut down 
the number of cells go into the brain. And that means interleukin 1 beta actually regulates macrophage go into the brain after wound, body wound injury. So we now think that we can find out the factor that can regulate those immune cells go into the brain or not. So that's why hopefully we can continue to use this kind of uh, silverfish as our experimental models to continue to look into the regulation of those macrophage and what happens of those macrophage go into the brain. So to understand the basic mechanism, of course, the eventual event is to allow us to think about the preventive measure to prevent neural inflammation and cognitive dysfunctions. So here we, I want to introduce, we have the pharmacological tools or non-pharmacological tools. As I said, ibuprofen is the one that you can buy over the counter, but be careful, you cannot use it consume for a long term because it will really affect your heart. And so we try to find out, is there any novel um, anti-inflammatory drugs that can allow us to control the body immune response and neural immune response. By doing this, and we accidentally find out that one drug that's used for anti-smoking, paranoquin, actually can prevent the inflammation and because our immune cells also have some neurotransmitter receptor. Now, in the past, in the textbook, when you learn about neurotransmitter, that means the signal between neurons, and you learn that they are, they occur in, they, they, they exit in neurons, but actually, this kind of neurotransmitter receptor also present in immune cells. And nicotinic receptor, as the coding, nicotinic as the coding receptor is one of those. And nicotinic as the coding receptor has two isoforms. One is called alpha-7 and one is called alpha-4-beta-2 because of the subunit formations of two uh, subunit forming together as a receptor. And we know that vanicillin used as anti-smoking drug, but it has also some effects that can prevent memory impairment and enhance working memory. And so we continue to understand why and how they affect the immune cells. And again, we use the similar protocol, and now we apply even to aged mice. The aging of the mice is now 18 months. 18 months for a mouse actually is already very old. So in the old mice, if we perform laparotomies, that means open up the uh, abdomens, take the intestine out, and then continue to, um, and then seal up the abdomen, and then after two weeks, look back your cytokine productions and we can find that actually in the liver and in the hippocampus so it has high uh, cytokine productions and uh, if we look into the microglia and astrocytes they are activated but if we add the veronicin in uh, um, before and after the surgical procedure then we can really significantly suppress body immune response and neuro immune response. And if we use the cognitive behavioral test, again, novel object recognition test or YMACE, and you can see that um, after surgical procedure, they have problems. And then if we add the um, variant, then they go back to normal. 
So we are very excited by this kind of um, novel way to activate cholinergic pathway and then to inhibit the body immune response. So the second line of summary here is to uh, understand that cognitive uh, dysfunctions also occur in the age mice after laparotomy. And also if we use venetokin um, to, um, to stimulate the alpha-4 beta nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, and this will exert anti-inflammatory uh, effects. Now, perhaps using medicine or drugs for some conditions and for some patients are uh, still ideal because they don't like to use drugs. The best, of course, not to use any chemical to inhibit your body immune response. So that's why we are thinking also on the non-pharmacological approach. And the best use actually is on exercise. Now, when I say exercise, you may think about aerobic exercise, running, jogging exercise. Of course, this is very good and very helpful to everyone. But think about for the elderly, if you are asking elderly to go out to run, to do some aerobic exercise, not 100% of elderly actually will follow you. And also if they have the motor dysfunctions, then they cannot enjoy much about aerobic exercise. So we are thinking about whether the, if we can apply some resistance training for those elderly, can they benefit from the, uh, uh, this kind of exercise? And this is what we want to understand. And that's the impact is on those elderly who doesn't know how to do aerobic or do, doesn't want to know to do aerobic exercise or even for some patients, if they lie down on the back and they can still do use their hand to do some resistant exercise. And so we try to um, think of a way to do animal experiments that we can do. And so if this is the animal experiments we are working, the mouse tighten up some weight and then we let them to climb up freely, not to time, not to force them to climb up. And this is the video that show that actually they like to enjoy the climb up and you can see the towels actually is tighten up some weight. And this is the way of what we do of resistant exercise. Now, if we, um, if we let them train for five weeks and then increase of the weight by 15% to 30, 50, and 75% of resistance gradually. And then we finally give them the novel object recognition tests, and YMA test again, and then to look into their um, body cognitive functions. The question we ask here is, does resistant exercise elicit neuroprotection to Alzheimer's disease? And the answer is actually yes. We compare the wild type mice and also the transgenic mice you usually for basic scientists to work on in the laboratory called the triple transgenic mice. That means the mouse carry three types of mutations. And so that's both tau protein and A and beta amyloid peptide proteins increase. And for after five weeks trainings, and you can see that the, if you compare those without training and those body weights increase, and but with this five week trainings, the body weights actually have no increase. And the Y maze, if you look into the number of error, actually, will go down back to nearly the wild type normal. 
actually. So if we look into the um, synaptic proteins, that is the synapse, that is the point, the site that uh, neurons can transmit the neurotransmitter and also receive the neurotransmitter to excite, to communicate well. So that site have lots of proteins, uh, we call the synaptic proteins. If we use Western broad protein uh, to assess the level of their proteins, and then we can see that in the frontal cortex in the hippocampus, those proteins level increase, and that's how the synaptic transmissions. If you look into the beta amyloid peptide deposits in the frontal cortex and the hippocampus, and we find they both reduce after resistant exercise. And also tau protein phosphorations is also being reduced. And this is very exciting for us to further understand why recent exercise can provide beneficial effects to the body. As I said, neuroimmune response is important. And then we find out that the frontal cortex and one region in the hippocampus also have reductions of the microglia activations, a number of microglia. Now, if we look into the pro-inflammatory cytokines, TNF-alpha decrease, and if we look into anti-inflammatory cytokines in the hippocampus, interleukin-10, interleukin-10 increase. And surprisingly, we also find that the after exercise, some good factors released from muscle actually can also beneficial to the brain uh, increase. For example, interleukin-6, or you can see from the liver, one of the factor, FGF21 increase. Now, these kind of factors can be released after exercise. And these kind of factors are beneficial to your whole body and also, of course, your brain. And because these kind of factors, good factors, increase after resistance exercise, just like you run aerobic exercise. And that's why it can reduce the tau protein phosphorylation. It can protect the brain to have higher neurosynaptic proteins. We can reduce, uh, attenuate the problem of cognitive dysfunctions and reduce the neural information. And this is the third line of, the, of my result. To conclude, the short-term resistance exercise training confer a large range of beneficial effects. And this is what I talk about. And we are ongoing uh, doing this kind of research projects, try to uh, pick out the key factors and also the mechanisms that's produced after the resistant exercise. Now, I have done, I have told you many different types of the um, risk factors. And from our basic science point of view, our laboratory study, we think that the convergent factors that all different diversify risk factor to harm the brain, and one of that is the body immune response, the body information, because this can stimulate neural information and then can uh, increase the accumulation of those pathological protein, bad proteins. And we try to use pharmacological approach, novel pharmacological approach and non-pharmacological approach to try to reduce the body immune response as well as neuroimmune response. The purpose of this, of course, is to reduce the risk of the increasing the number of the Alzheimer's disease patients. Just like this dash curve, hopefully we can reduce the number of people suffering from 
L7 disease. And this is uh, the end of my talk. And this uh, is my group, current group member, and also thanks for the previous uh, group members in my team and my collaborator all over the world. And this is our um, institutes in the Faculty of Medicines. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Chang. A fabulous presentation. I would like to put some questions to you. We have three questions and enough time to answer each one in detail. So I'll begin with a more specific question that comes from your presentation, which is that um, the findings in human research regarding the relationship between the use of anti-inflammatory drugs over life and the incidence of dementia, mm -hmm. for instance, treating conditions such as rheumatism, mm -hmm. Are there studies showing a lower incidence of dementia in such populations mm. with drugs for rheumatism? For um, the rheumatoid arthritis, um, the result is quite um, a little bit controversial because some studies are very good, some studies are not good. And we still try to understand why. And actually, I told you many factors that can be affected by the immune response in the brain, uh, immune response in the body. But recently, we found one very surprising, and we still don't know how to explain results is, in depressions, we found body immune response, but we couldn't find neuroimmune response in the brain. And that may tell us that in some e issue and some factor that may um, making confusions of to us that's why some study is successful to anti-inflammation approach and some study is not um, uh, beneficial. Thank you very much. The second question that's come through is this. Have you explored whether differences in memory identified using the novel object recognition task are also present in social situations by, by looking at differences in conspecific anogenital sniffing? Said another way, are the memory impairments you identified in the mice experiments also present in social situations? Yes, indeed, yes because um, we can have a different way to do uh, field tests. In fact, in my, in my lab, we have also the puzzle box tests. We have social interaction tests. Um, this is because we have to limit the number of trial for uh, behavioral tests for our animals. We cannot do so many different behavioral tests. And that's why we limit, usually limit to um, uh, test to uh, novel object recognition tests or YMIS, but it really represents the, um, the uh, hippocampal dependent mem learning memory, actually. Thank you. And here's the question on everybody's lips, so you can spend as much time as you like answering this one. Please comment on the recent clinical trials with aducanumab. Well, um, uh, I think this is very clear to us that at the very beginning or in the uh, initial state, it's worked very well. But once you have the, um, the loss of pathogen deposits, I think even though this antibody is not sufficient to dissolve uh, all this aggregate and uh, to resolve all the problems. Um, but I would say it's still good for the patient to try uh, to you to, to, for the clinician to prescribe to the patients because we simply don't have any other types of the 
um, disease uh, um, uh, or mechanisms relieving uh, drugs or mechanism modifying drugs. So I think even there's a controversial issue here, and, but I support the application of this antibody to the patients. Thank you, that's very clear. And the final question about the impact of coronavirus. So you've spent a great deal of time talking about inflammation. You've mentioned cytokine storms, and I wonder if you could translate your work into the impact of COVID on the elderly and the probability of developing Alzheimer's disease. Well, I think um, this can speed up the neurodegenerations and already have some reports showing you that um, uh, the frontal cortex become thinner. And that is clearly the neurodegeneration or neuronal loss. And also you heard about that patients may have problems of smelling and that is clearly the neuronal loss in the olfactory bulbs. And so um, it's clearly, it's a um, speed up process of Alzheimer's disease. And you even don't need any um, deposits of beta amyloid or cow proteins, and you can uh, speed up the whole de you know, degenerative process 100 times or even 1,000 times within a short period of time. And so that's why uh, we have to be careful of the COVID-19, the coronavirus go into the brain or the brain uh, the cytokine storm go into the brain. Thank you so much. I'm going to open up to the panelists who may have a question. Um, if not, we will take a brief pause and reset for the upcoming presentation of Professor Livingston. And that will occur in 10 minutes time. Are there any further questions from the panelists for Professor Chung? I hope it's not a two uh narrow or too special <laughs> for all the audience. No, we greatly appreciate your insights, uh, principally because your ability to use animal models is so necessary, but also that you're centered in the Greater Bay Area. And maybe before we finish, you could just comment a little bit on your insights. I know you work in Macau, you also work in Shenzhen, you have a great deal of knowledge about the local environment. Maybe you could comment a bit on this before we move to Professor Livingston. I think uh, the Greater Bay Area is a, a very good place to interact with each other. And so right now, um, this area plays heavy uh, uh, funding for new university or provide more funding for research in the university. Now, in the in every university in this area. And so that's why this is a very good opportunity that we can work together. Uh, some may be uh, good for animal experiments, some may be good for silverfish experiments, and some may be good for clinical experiments. We can uh, um, connect together. Maybe same questions, my clinical colleagues will collect all the clinical data from the hospitals and then we, in the laboratory, we can do using animal laboratory animals to, uh, to continue to work on the mechanism and preventive uh, idea. And then if we can successfully do it in the animal, then we can pass to a clinical trial in this area. And this mm -hmm. is a very, very good opportunity for us to collaborate together. Mm -hmm. And in the context of this work you're doing on animal models, is there, Similar work going on in Guangdong province. I'm aware, unaware of it, but maybe you could comment on that. For the first part of the laparotomy, is uh, um, right now is still uh, not uh, um, mature to a clinical trial. But for the uh, problem in the periodontitis, and now um, lots of the uh, dental hospitals or dental clinic actually now is working hard to try to think about how to A, improve the oral health for the elderly, for the uh, um, patients, and B, is, uh, is there any special uh, treatments 
for the patient because we are not going to simply give some antibiotics and that is because we show that actually uh, I, I don't have time to show this. If you just give antibiotics to the patients, it's not going to help for the brain. It's going to help on the oral cavity only. <laughs> Very interesting. And so I can't help but say that uh, the University of Hong Kong supporting your research and mine in the past as the world's number one ranked school of dentistry. So I believe there's a great deal of yeah. synergy possible for yeah, yeah. making sure that uh, seniors in the greater barrier are aging well. So once again, thank you very much, Raymond. We'll take a brief pause. Please return again at, um, the, uh, at 4 p.m. in Hong Kong, and we yes. shall see you shortly. Thank you so much. Raymond will be thank the you. chair of the next session. Thank you.